Welcome back. We're so glad that you decided to spend some time with us today. This update may run a bit longer than usual, as we have some very important information to share about the 2021 school year. We've actually broken up today's installment into two segments. First, I'm gonna share some data we compiled after having conversations about returning to school with about 4,000 of our parents and guardians over the past two weeks. Then in our second segment, I'm going to engage a number of our task force facilitators about what they think school will look like when we return in August. So let's get started. Over the past two weeks, we reached out to each household in Bedford County that has at least one student registered for the upcoming school year. I am so thankful for the teachers and other staff who made these calls, connected with families, and listened to their thoughts, concerns, and ideas about returning to school. As of July 1st, we had connected with 3,991 families, which represents 64% of the total number of households. For any parents that we weren't able to reach by phone, be on the lookout for an email with an electronic survey in the next few days. Please complete that survey quickly so that we can better understand your individual situation and prepare as best we can to support your child or children this fall. At this point, I'm going to share my screen and summarize four of the major data sets that resulted from our outreach efforts. What I'm about to share reflects information as of July 1, when we recorded this broadcast, but we will continue to update these results as we're able to connect with more families. The first data set I want to share is when we asked families, do they plan to have their children return to school in the fall? You'll notice here that about three-fourths, or 77%, said yes, they do intend to return their children to school this fall. You'll also notice that a very small percent, about 4%, indicated that they would not be having their children return to the fall, which means that everybody else hasn't decided at this point and they want some more time to make that decision. The next question I wanna share the results from is if you don't plan to send your children back to school, would you be interested in a 100% remote learning option? Again, we only asked this question to those that didn't say yes to the previous question about returning to school. So of the families that we asked this question to, about three fourths or 75% said yes, they would be interested in a 100% remote learning option. About 11% said they wouldn't be, which left about 13% saying that they haven't decided yet. And this question I think is on the minds of a lot of people because transportation is proving to be one of the biggest challenges for us to return to school safely. So in this question, we asked, are you willing and able to transport your children to school by car if necessary? And the results here say that about two thirds or 66% say that they can drive their children to and from school where about 17% are saying they cannot, and another 18% are saying they might be able to, or perhaps they can only provide it part of the time, maybe in the mornings, but not the afternoons, maybe certain days of the weeks, but not others. As we talk about remote learning and also other options that we may be considering for returning to school this fall, one of the questions that is really important is about internet access. And here we asked simply, does your family have access to reliable internet? And you can see from the results about three fourths or 74% said they do have reliable internet access, while about a fourth or 26% said that they don't. And I wanna also let you know that we asked a number of open-ended questions. And although we don't have graphs to express these responses, it's clear that most families would like us to offer in-person learning to as many students as possible on a schedule that closely resembles how we operated prior to the school closures in March. We also heard a great deal of concern about the impact of social isolation on children during the past four months, accompanied by requests that we focus on meeting the social and emotional needs of learners when they return. So now that you know a little bit about how parents and guardians responded to our outreach efforts, we'd like to share an update on our return to school planning efforts. Although we will only be joined by six individuals, 
This update represents the work of more than 150 people on nine task forces who have worked tirelessly over the past five weeks to develop plans that balance health and safety concerns with the need to return to school. Joining us today in no particular order are Lisa Dellis, principal of Bedford Primary School, Justin Tucker, principal of Stanton River Middle School, Sean Trosper, principal of Liberty High School, Ed Hoisington, director of technology, Beth Robertson, associate director of learner support services, and Mac Dewis, chief operations officer. Mac, let me start with a question for you. We know that health and safety is on many people's minds. So what can you tell our audience about the many health and safety precautions that will be in place when we return to school? Well, thank you, you're right. Safety for our students and staff is, is a top priority, no question. And we've been carefully reviewing all the guidance from the CDC, the Virginia Department of Health, um, from the Department of Education and other sources so that we um, learn what the best practices are. Um, we're gonna be trying to declutter spaces um, so that we can clean them more easily and increase the frequency of that cleaning um, through the day. We're going to be trying to instill habits of hand washing and hand sanitizer use in all of our students and staff. And we'll be putting many more hand sanitizer stations uh, in our buildings. Uh, we're gonna be altering our procedures um, in, in almost all aspects of our work. Um, we're gonna be limiting the number of visitors coming into buildings. We'll be instituting physical distancing whenever we possibly can. Um, we'll be having staff wear face coverings when that physical distancing is not possible and we'll be encouraging students to do the same thing. Um, and, and maybe most importantly, we'll be really managing the groupings of our students so that we can minimize the amount of mixing going on to, um, to limit the virus spread if it were to be present uh, in our schools. Um, so not only will those procedures in our, in our school buildings be altered, but also for transportation on our buses. Um, we'll be asking as many families as possible to drive to school um, and, and pick up from school um, every day. Uh, so that we can reduce the number of students on our buses to a safe level uh, and they can be distanced while riding. Um, we plan to have one student per seat. Um, we'll have hand sanitizer stations on the bus for getting on and off and drivers will be monitoring where on the seats students are even sitting so that um, we can maintain as much distancing as we can during the, during the bus ride. We'll also be letting windows down whenever the weather allows us to, to, to increase the amount of fresh air that's, that's getting on and off uh, buses. Um, and, and so we want to ask families, you know, probably within the next couple of weeks to be on the lookout for some communication to help finalize those transportation plans so that we can make the uh, bus routing plans we need work and, and also the traffic safety plans at schools work for, um, for car riders as well. Um, Safety plans and health plans will be in place for any extracurricular activities going on this summer and to the extent they are allowed to, to operate during the school year. Um, we'll be looking at cleaning protocols and distancing protocols and the design of those activities themselves. Um, and to make all of that work, we know our staff need to be trained. Um, and our students need to be trained. So we'll be doing that in a variety of ways. Um, for, for cleaning, for procedures, for, um, you know, really all the functions through the day so that we can make sure that um, the real focus here can be on learning and we can, you know, really build the uh, routines and procedures in place to keep us all safe. Thank you, Mac. Uh, and, you know, we do know that many people are concerned about the health and safety of the children, of the adults, and we're so glad that Bedford County Public Schools is taking all the precautions that you just mentioned. Um, but we also know that many people out there just want to know some basic information about when we're going to return to school and, and what changes, large or small, we, we can expect when we do return. So let me start by asking the principals on our panel, and we'll start with Lisa. You know, what, what education in Bedford County may look like 
for the different ages of learners that we serve. The Young Learners Task Force, which serves grades pre-K through three, met multiple times throughout this time frame. We really focused on what the developmental needs are for our children, as well as academic and supports that families may need at home as well. Our conclusion was that all students from preschool through third grade would benefit from face-to-face -face instruction daily. So our plan is for all students in preschool through third grade to attend school daily for that face-to-face -face instruction. This was confirmed by input from family surveys that that's an, an area that they really and truly felt was important as well. In order to promote the safety of our students and health of our students and staff as well, we are going to obviously follow the health and safety plan that Dr. Dewis mentioned. Part of that will be ensuring that we have smaller classroom sizes to utilize the physical and social distancing recommended by the CDC and Virginia Health Department. This will likely impact some of the classroom locations. In fact, at this point in time, in working with the larger group of facilitators, we've determined that all students preschool through third grade will be served in the elementary schools along with some of the fourth graders. At Bedford Primary, we have a unique situation in which we were previously a preschool through first grade school. However, our first graders will be moving to Bedford Elementary in order to accommodate for the physical distancing to promote health and safety for our children. In addition, we're gonna limit transitions within the school environment for groups of students to prevent mixing of groups. In doing so, we will also increase movement activities for our children within the classroom because we do recognize that that is part of developmental needs for young children. Teachers and staff will rotate in and out of classrooms to support the students in their locations. Another option that may be utilized is having breakfast and lunch in an alternative location other than the cafeteria such as the classroom or even possibly outside settings when weather permits. We will be following the established health and care um, health care plan to increase the in cleaning within our classrooms. There are going to be a lot of major components in that plan as Dr. Dewis mentioned with some training and with support from staff for children to understand that as well. One major aspect that will be easily observed is that staff members will be wearing face masks or face coverings when they are unable to maintain a six foot distance from others. Students, however, will only be able to, or only be required to wear a face covering when riding the school bus at this age. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Justin, I know you worked with uh, the next set of, of learners, those in grades four to six. Can you share what your task force is, is planning moving forward into the fall? Well, as you said, Dr. Shook, the intermediate task force really focused on learning for um, students in grades four, five, and six. Um, and from the get-go, we have really felt that this is a very unique and pivotal age in the life of a child. And so for us, it came back to reviewing the survey results so we could understand what our families wanted, um, consulting with our own diverse task force, which really represented um, a spread of different staff members, parents, and students within that fourth grade to sixth grade range, as well as um, representatives from across our division, because we knew that we would really need to focus on developmental appropriateness and social emotional needs of these students. Um, so like the Young Learning Task Force that Ms. Dellis presented, um, we too agreed that students in grades four, five, and six uh, really need daily face-to-face -face instruction um, that is essential for their development as students in this age group. Uh, we recognize that in this age group, uh, learners are developing lifelong social emotional skills that are really best developed when they get to interact with others in a face-to-face -face setting. Um, we also know that this is the phase of development where students are beginning to develop some of those independent skills um, where they are more capable of making their own informed decisions, um, but that at the same time, they still need quite a lot of support and guidance um, from a trusted adult who can guide that learning process. Um, so to that end, many of our health and safety protocols are going to be very similar to what Ms. Dellis discussed with the Young Learning Group. So I won't reiterate all of those, um, but we too will be maintaining physical distancing as much as possible, as well as many of the other mitigation strategies she mentioned. Um, we'll be working to do things like reduce transitions during the day, reduce mixing of various student groups throughout the day, which, again, as Ms. Stella said, may mean that some of our classrooms are relocated, that our lunch procedures 
even our arrival and dismissal procedures are somewhat altered uh, because we really want to promote health and safety to the greatest extent possible so we can keep those students here in, in that daily face-to-face -face settings. Um, to do this, we very quickly realized that we simply do not have enough physical space in our existing elementary schools in Bedford County. Uh, so as a result of that, our collective group has decided that all fifth graders in Bedford County Public Schools, with the exception of those in the adapted curriculum program, and some fourth graders will transition to the middle school buildings in their zone for the 2021 school year. Uh, this really for us was just a requirement in order to create enough space to provide for social distancing. And again, making these transitions is what allows us to bring fourth, fifth, and sixth graders into our buildings every day, which as I said, for us was very, very important. Uh, we're currently working on the details of exactly what our school day is going to look like, which will also include the actual instructional hours and when school will start and finish each day. And as we consider all of those things, we know that there, there are other factors related to transportation and other logistics. So we hope that we'll be able to get that information out very quickly. Um, but again, for our group, what it came back to is recognizing that this is a time in the life of a learner where they're moving towards some independence, but they're still developing a lot of essential skills um, that they'll likely gain most effectively in that face-to-face -face setting. So we're very excited that by repurposing some of our buildings and our classrooms, that we'll be able to provide daily face-to-face -face instruction for students in grades four, five, and six. Thank you, Justin, and, and thank you, Lisa. And just so I'm clear and our audience is clear, when we say daily, are, are you both saying that, that our plan right now is five days a week, we would bring in pre-K through sixth grade, even though some of the locations might be different than what people are used to? Yes, sir, that's correct. Our plan is that these students need as much consistency and as much engagement in the learning process as they can get. So we're planning for a full five-day week. Okay, and have you talked at all in your task forces about if the school day is gonna be the same length as what people are used to? Or, or what, what is your thinking around that? We've talked about that in the intermediate task force level, um, both as, among our task force as well as the greater group of facilitators, um, recognizing that there are a lot of operational factors at play, uh, transportation and our ability to maintain group sizes on buses, may have an impact on when we can start and finish school each day. We also recognize that part of the time that we build into each school day is simply for transitions, from moving from room to room, moving to the cafeteria, and some of these things won't be the same as they've always been. So at this point, we do not have an exact decision about the length of the school day, but it's certainly something that may be somewhat altered um, for students in the intermediate group. And, and Lisa, is your task force uh, and the group thinking about, uh, again, a, a possible alteration to the school day that the parents and families are used to from previous years? As Mr. Tucker mentioned, we are looking at that to be possibly a little bit different than what we have experienced in the past. Those transitions and times that were more downtime, we can actually use as more instructional time and in working with kids to meet their needs. So there may be adjustments to start and stop times at the um, youngest learners level as well. Okay, well, thank you both again. And at this point, I want to bring Sean into the conversation um, because it sounds from what Lisa and Justin are sharing with us, uh, we are prioritizing daily in-person learning opportunities for our youngest students up, up through the sixth grade. And it also sounds like we're, we're going to be moving some of our upper elementary into the middle schools in order to keep things uh, healthy and safe uh, following the guidelines that Dr. Dewis and others have shared. So uh, what can you share with our audience about learning and what it may look like for the older learners, those, those in grades seven through 12? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shook. So I served on the Adolescent Task Force and you know, when, when we worked through our uh, challenges of, of trying to bring students back, we had to consider a number of priorities. And, and first and foremost, which is always a priority is the safety of our students. And so uh, we had to think about their physical safety and how to maintain social distancing guidelines and, and understanding contact tracing and with considering the building capacity, just like the, the other task forces. And um, alongside student safety is the emotional safety. And so we really decided with our schedule to prioritize relationships uh, with students and staff among peers. And, and so at the forefront of, of all of our discussions were, were student uh, mental health, uh, 
uh, students who, who may come from traumatic backgrounds, students with disabilities, and, and there are those that just struggle um, with school and need additional support. So we wanted to make sure that we connected them with school also in a way that's meaningful for them. Uh, another priority was that we wanted to really maintain the fidelity of course requests that students have developed along with their counselors so they can continue to progress towards graduation um, as we come through this, this uh, upcoming school year. It was important that we provide face-to-face -face support uh, with the teacher of record and, and, and with students. And so we wanted to provide a structure where that was possible. And another really a big challenge, but a priority for us was, was recognizing the importance of electives uh, in this adolescent, middle and high school schedule. That, those courses really connect students to school. They play such a big part in our culture. And so, so it was important that, that we provide that, but it is gonna look a little different. And so the challenge with maintaining those priorities is that the guidelines provided by our Department of Education and, and by the CDC, they don't really describe a traditional middle and high school schedule. So really under those guidelines, we cannot just run a traditional bell schedule like we're used to. Uh, and, and so I wanna take just a few minutes just to describe that schedule. And so as we've already said, K-6 is going to go to school all day, every day. And, and so to do that and to protect social distancing guidelines, they are gonna have to spread out. And so what that means is we are going to have uh, Students in grades seven through 12 in Bedford County are now going to uh, be located at the high schools. Um, and at the high schools, we believe that we can provide a meaningful learning experience for those students um, while they come in with in a, a modified format. So here's kind of what it's gonna look like for adolescents. The first is we're gonna connect each of our students to a learning coach. And so students will be assigned to a cohort of students that's run by a staff member who will serve as a as their primary academic and personal growth coach while they are on campus. And so students will have the option of coming into that coach's space either daily or on a schedule agreed upon uh, by that student and coach. What we're gonna do is we're gonna set up an AB rotation. So every student will be a part of either an A group or a B group. And so that way we can keep our buildings at that 50% capacity that's gonna be required for much of the, the phasing guidelines. Um, and then students can come into the building, have access to their teachers and their learning coach two to three times a week on the schedule. Uh, we also hope that we can provide some flexibility to where some students who need to come every day, if that's what their coach or their case manager or an IP team, for example, agree upon, we wanna provide that flexibility. Um, but then also there's flexibility for those that may not necessarily need to come in every day and who can do their work virtually. As far as instruction goes, each of our teachers are gonna be expected to maintain a virtual presence. So they're gonna to have to provide instruction, support, content delivery, uh, again, primarily virtually. And so students will work on their coursework primarily in this learning coaches space, and teachers will have office hours where students can uh, come to them and teachers can provide guided assistance through individualized or small group instruction so students can work with their learning coach to schedule times to go to that teacher of record and receive that instruction, again, under those guidelines established by, by the CDC and the Department of Education. And, and so really each day students will work with that learning coach to create a schedule uh, to decide where they're gonna go and who they're gonna work with. Our, our schedule will kind of operate on a semester schedule because one of the things that we've heard is that when a student takes a full course load, so most students in, in middle and high school are, are working on six to seven courses at a time. The feedback we heard from families is, is they were pretty overwhelmed with doing that all at once. And so we wanted to kind of modify that to help them focus on certain courses at a time. So first semester, students will focus on three courses at a time. Second semester, they will focus on three with the option to add a fourth course. So Students will have a minimum of, of six courses and a maximum of eight courses that they will uh, achieve credit for throughout the school year. Uh, again, just to really think about the feedback that we receive from our families. Uh, and then finally, electives. So some courses work pretty well with virtual learning and, and can easily adapt and some just don't. And there are certain electives that was really important that we allow face-to-face -face time as much as we could. And so I'm thinking of maybe a shop class, CTE, fine arts classes. Um, and so we wanted to allow face to face as long as we can, but I really want to emphasize Dr. Shook that students will have access to, to be able to schedule times to work um, in small groups and individualized support with those teachers. Um, but at the same time, it is going to look different. We cannot just rotate 
a, a full group of students in and mixed groups of students um, to do that. And so, so we will provide that, but again, under a modified format. And so ultimately we've created a schedule where, again, where we prioritize the safety of our students or we've prioritized uh, the course selection that they, they have worked on with their counselor, but ultimately we want to do what's best for students and provide a meaningful learning experience. Um, and so that's kind of an overview of the adolescent task force. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and we know that that group that you've been working with um, has really been challenged in, in this space, uh, as the other groups have as well. But where the, the younger groups are, are more focused on, I think, some of the health and safety and mitigation strategies and are still keeping that face-to-face -face continuity in line. This adolescent group is approaching things from a very different way. So I, I like what you said. I, I think for our seventh through 12th graders, school is going to look and feel very different. And um, we're asking everyone to work with us to make this successful um, because it will be very different. We're going to be asking a lot of our students. We're going to be asking a lot of our teachers. And we're going to be asking a lot of our families to make all of this work. But uh, I'm really encouraged to hear what your task force uh, has developed and what we're planning to do. Uh, and you know, you mentioned this and others mentioned this. Uh, and also earlier in this segment, I shared that parents have expressed concerns about the social and emotional well-being of their children during the school closure, you know, basically since last March. Um, but they're also concerned about when they return to school. So um, Beth, can you share about the work of your task force and how we plan to meet those social emotional needs when learners of all ages return in the fall? Yes, I'd be happy to talk about that. It's been a real pleasure working not only with my task force, the social and emotional learning task force, so the others, the young, intermediate, and adolescent groups. And throughout that work has been the recognition that the impact of school closure has impacted the social and emotional health of many of our learners. So one of the priorities of our task force has been to ensure that we're organizing activities around the importance of protecting the mental health of our students as vigorously as we protect their physical health right now. For the adolescent group, you heard Dr. Trosper mention the learning coach for our adolescent programs. I wanna talk a little bit more about that because that's a critical piece of what's happening for our learners in grades seven through 12. Each learning coach will have a small group of students for whom he or she will be connected for the school year. That learning coach will start the year with very specific activities, first and foremost, to help the student connect to their learning community, and then to establish personal and academic goals for course, semester, year, and long-term. The learning coach will support the student in identifying post-secondary pathways or exploration of, exploration of personal and career growth activities. But one important part of that is also the facilitation of the blended learning model, as Dr. Trosper mentioned. The learning coach will assist the student in assessing course progress, identifying their own learning needs, finding needed supports, and even scheduling small group arrangements for courses. One advantage also of this learning coach is it now provides a direct and single point of contact for families during remote learning times. That's something that we certainly heard from families was important when we're thinking about courses that have a blended learning element. For the young and intermediate learners, we're also gonna be providing more explicit instruction in specific social and emotional competencies, which we know will enrich that academic learning experience. When we think about grouping students the way we're going to be doing, the development of a learning community is really integral to the whole child experience of wellness in the classroom. Our mental health support teams with leadership from our school counselors at each school, will be assisting with curriculum development for social emotional learning competencies that will be delivered through natural and embedded activities within these classroom groups. We do wanna recognize that with our young and intermediate students, children still need to have freedoms to be children, even with guidelines that we need to keep them safe. So we want to assure families that our safety protocols will be balanced with a healthy attitude towards necessary learning in social endeavors. Lastly, a collective voice from each of the task force teams at the young, intermediate, and adolescent level is that the return to school has to prioritize time to reconnect. 
our students and our teachers are learning school in a very new way. We're learning new routines, new procedures, and these initial weeks of school must be organized around ensuring that our learners feel secure and that relationships are strengthened. We will not return in those first initial weeks to immediate plans for academic skill assessment or intense academic remediation and recovery, but rather allow the opportunity to reorient to the school community first. Academic work routines will be introduced once student readiness is established, allowing each student time to feel safe and secure. It's been really exciting to have teachers and school professionals who have been a part of this task force work who are really excited as we talk about the social and emotional learning necessities and it really characterized a lot of this work as the reconnection to the why we became teachers and that is the relationship with the students that are in front of us each day. Thank you Beth and, and thanks to all of you for sharing what learning may look like in the fall for the students that return to us but uh, we also know from our outreach efforts that many families just aren't comfortable returning their children to school, and that most of these families are interested in a 100% remote learning option. So Ed, what can you tell us about remote learning in 2020-21? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shook. Uh, we did have a large number of families that did express interest in a remote option, 100% remote option. So in Bedford County, this will be a district-wide learning opportunity, which will be outside the traditional school model. Uh, we plan to provide instruction for grades kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, this option will have its own faculty, uh, its own teachers. Uh, we will be working closely with Virtual Virginia, which is the platform that Virginia has for its virtual schools through a, a platform called Canvas. Uh, we will develop coursework with Virtual Virginia, also with Edgenuity, which is an online curriculum company. So there'll be plenty of opportunities for students to really engage in learning online. Uh, instructors will have the option to build courses from some base courses that are offered maybe through Virtual Virginia. We are doing our best to try to provide every opportunity for those that choose online learning or this 100% remote option to reflect what those students are, are receiving within our building. So we are, are trying to do our best to, to provide uh, an equal equitable education online, as well as uh, what is being provided in the traditional setting. Um, there will be plenty of opportunities for cross-curricular work. Uh, we are designing, designing this coursework so that students can work at their own pace. Um, we will be you know, using the online platforms, as I have already mentioned, with regards to uh, Edgenuity, Virtual Virginia and make, making sure that we are adapting this uh, for individuals and making sure that students can have the opportunity to learn remotely uh, if they so choose. Thank you, Ed. Uh, and I think that's really important that families know that they have those options. And, and just as a side note, uh, we took a poll during this presentation and voted that you have the best background of any of us that are on this panel. So uh, congratulations for that as well. And, and it sounds like from what you're saying that having a reliable internet connection at home is really important for remote learning. And you know, earlier we shared that about three fourths of families are saying that they currently have that access. Uh, Mac, uh, what can you share about the work that's being done to improve not just the access, but also the affordability of, of internet to the many families in Bedford County who need that, whether they're electing the remote learning option or not. Right, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think Bedford is fortunate to have three quarters of families um, with a reliable internet, uh, high-speed internet connection at this point, but 20, 25% or a quarter of our families is still a large number who, who don't. And so through a two-pronged strategy, our task force has really been looking at um, trying to expand internet coverage areas in the county and also um, tackle some strategies for families who may struggle financially, uh, even if uh, internet access is available. Um, Bedford County, um, 
has prioritized increasing broadband um, access for a number of years and is in the middle of a tower building project that will provide high-speed internet access to parts of the county who've never had it before. Um, we're going to be very quickly studying coverage areas to determine um, options for families uh, throughout the county. So whether those towers with brisk net internet service um, are available or whether it's through companies like Chintel, Comcast, and B2X who ha already have a footprint in different parts of the county um, or whether they're uh, cellular options through companies like Verizon um, that are available for hotspots. We're going to be looking at all of those strategies and trying to connect each and every family with one of those um, and then working hard to find assistance for those families in need who, who may not be able to immediately afford um, a hookup fee, uh, an installation service fee, or, um, or even high monthly bills for services. So um, the companies who serve our areas are, have been very forthcoming and very helpful in um, providing information and we'll be uh, getting that out to families just as soon as we can as these as the tower project um, continues through the summer and um, other options are available. Thank you, Mac. We know how important that is, not just for the remote learning families out there, but as we listen to Sean describe what that seven through 12 model looks like, and the fact that a lot of that work is going to be remote or, or virtual, we just know how important having affordable um, and available internet access is. So it's great to hear that the county is working on, on making that happen. Uh, I think the other reason we need to make sure we have as much coverage as possible is we don't know at any time what may be happening with this pandemic. And, and the state has asked us to prepare for a potential closure again during next school year. And, and we, we learned from last spring that that internet access limited our availability to continue learning for, for so many families. Uh, so we appreciate that work. Uh, now, we've discussed a number of important issues related to the reopening of schools, but the one thing I haven't heard is when we actually plan to start the school year. And I know that's something that many watching this broadcast are probably anxious to learn. And I, and I realize that all these plans are still subject to changes, but can any of you share our current thinking about start dates for the school year? You're right. There are a lot of work moving parts in what we're planning and things may change. However, at this point in time, we were truly focused on the health and safety of our children when they're here, as well as getting to and from school. So transportation is working closely with um, the schools to figure out what those bus routes will look like. I will say that as far as our youngest learners, those that will be served within an elementary school, whether they're pre-K through three or pre-K through four, the start date at this point in time is planned for Wednesday, August the 12th, which was the original start date for our calendar for the 2021 school year. I can share as well for the adolescent group. Um, you know, we recognize many of the same things that um, there are a lot of factors at play here with transportation and different logistics going on um, that we, we want to be able to get our students here every day as well. And so our goal, much like the Young Learning Task Force uh, at the intermediate level, is to aim to start on what was the originally scheduled first day of school, Wednesday, August 12th. Um, but we recognize that as we continue to get information from our families about who plans to drive and who plans to have their child ride the bus, um, that we may need some flexibility there. And so we're hoping that we can stick to that initial start date of Wednesday, August 12th, but recognize that we may, may need a one day buffer by moving to Thursday, August 13th to do that. Um, and certainly know that as these moving parts kind of reach their levels of completion, we'll have, have a better decision for that. But our goal is to start as close to that time as possible, just to provide the consistency um, and to get back to the work that we know needs to be done with our students. And Dr. Shook, we're gonna allow our students in grades K through six some time to work through some of the operational logistics, allow a school board office to provide support and prioritize that. And, and also while, while we recognize that school will look different, um, what will not change is our commitment to providing high quality instruction and a meaningful learning experience. So we're gonna continue to provide professional development to our uh, adolescent teachers. And for that reason, we're gonna start on August the 17th. So just a little bit later, just to allow all those things to take place. So Monday, August the 17th, we will start. 
Well, thank you for that. And uh, again, I know that's one question that many of us are getting uh, from various places in our community, from our employees, from our families, and, and others that are just very interested in, in our start dates. So, you know, we've shared quite a bit of information today, and, and I want to thank all of you panelists for your work on our task forces, as well as providing this update to our community. I, I, I wish I could say confidently that the plans shared today are definite, but I can't give you that promise, as our planning is constantly changing based on updated state guidance, as well as new information that we learn every day. I appreciate everyone's patience and flexibility as we continue to operationalize and refine the plans that we shared today. Once these plans are more solidified, we will post them on our website and also share them in a number of formats. Lastly, I wanna remind everyone that these plans will likely change after the school year begins. So again, patience and flexibility from everyone will be the key to success. And speaking of success, I wanna remind everyone that our mission in Bedford County Public Schools is to empower learners for future success. Although returning to school will require the combined effort of thousands of adults, the focus of our work needs to always be on the children that we serve. If you wanna learn more details about any information that we shared today, please tune in to the Bedford County School Board meeting, which will be live streamed on our BCPS YouTube channel starting at 5 p.m. on Thursday, July 9th. Thanks for tuning in and please stay safe.